Hello, and welcome to a brand new day of free-to-play in Magic the Gathering Arena. Get the dish on the latest with me, Lord Drumfish. Today we are diving into red. This is part six of the deck building toolbox guide. The idea of this guide is to give you a host of ideas that can fit into a variety of different deck archetypes to give you a toolbox of cards. So you can craft any archetype of deck that you might desire. All right, let's go ahead and dive in here. So Mishra's Research Desk. This is a red card because of its unearth cost. This goes uh, fantastic into the Rakdos Anvil deck. Um, this one, along with Experimental Synthesizer, both just make the deck tick. You could choose between one and the other. I think they're so good that um, you should probably run some of both. You probably want more than four of this effect. The main difference here is the uh, synthesizer requires you to play the card the same turn. So you have to be careful about making your land drops when you're using the experimental synthesizer. Uh, you want to make sure if you hit a land that you can play it off of the synthesizer. Um, I like the Synthesizer a little bit better for that deck, even though it's more awkward to use because of the same turn clause. Because one, you play it for one red, you know, it does its effect for one red, then you can sacrifice it with the Anvil and get its uh, Leaves Play trigger for free for no mana cost. So it's one up front and then on the back side it's zero if you sacrifice it through another means. You can also sacrifice it for three to get a samurai. I don't do that very often, but it occasionally comes up. Mishra's research desk. Um, the great parts about this card is that you get to choose one of two cards and then you can play it until the end of your next turn. So it gives you uh, a deeper look into the library, and it gives you a longer window in which to play the card. Uh, the downside, of course, is that it's two mana for your first activation of this, and then it's three mana for your second activation of this. So for the added value um, and you know, sort of ease of play that you get with Mishra's research desk, you're paying five mana. Two mana the first time, three mana the second time. Exper Experimental Synthesizer, as I said, can be one mana and then nothing. This is why I like the Synthesizer better. I still think it might be worth having two or three copies alongside the Synthesizer in your Anvil deck. Other red decks you know, you could run these cards and get value out of them in other red decks. Um, if you're not specifically focused on artifact synergies, then the card I like better for doing that is Reckless Impulse. We'll talk about it later. All right, Cacophony Scamp. This card is a 1-1. One, one. When it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target, so already it's uh, trading up with two drops, potentially, or it could trade with a pair of one toughness creatures. Um, also, you have the option that when you deal combat damage to a player, you can sack it to proliferate. Even if you have nothing to proliferate, there might possibly be times that you want to sacrifice it to do the one damage to something. So, Overall, whether you have counters in your deck or not, this is a totally solid one drop. Consider using it. In the festivities. So, this has been a niche card in standard. I've tried to use it with mixed results here and there. It's seen a little bit of prominence again, as one toughness creatures have seen a little prominence again in best of one. Uh, this is especially popular to pair with Mechanized Warfare. It's a red rare enchantment for three, uh, boosts the damage of all your artifacts and red sources by one point. Which turns this into a pretty reasonable aggro sweeper 
um, cleans up early cards off the battlefield. And if you get two in the festivities, or if you get you know two mechanized warfares, it can start sweeping bigger things. It also deals damage to the opponent's face, and it's one-sided. I can see the appeal, um, but mechanized warfare is a rare, and I'm not 100% sold that you should craft it. Uh, which means this card is a little bit more narrow, and uh, if you want one or two copies to potentially blow out some might tokens or other things you might see, then uh, it'll probably do fine. I don't know that I'd want four copies for a deck though, unless you're going heavily into either Mechanized Warfare or a mythic red creature from uh, Phyrexia All Will Be One that we'll talk about later. If you have that card, you might want in the festivities as well. All right, Flame Blessed Bolt. Flame Blessed Bolt cannot hit the face. You can't kill the opponent with this card. That being said, you can exile a creature or planeswalker that takes damage from it. And that effect still works, um, even if you uh, deal the damage from multiple sources over the course of the turn. It, until the end of that turn, the effect of Flame Blessed Bolt is still there. This is great uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I don't know if you quite want to have four copies, but I think two or three copies is completely reasonable. All four might even be good, especially if you get a lot of aggro matchups, like often happens in Best of One. So the Soldier deck gets a lot of value out of its graveyard. There's a one mana artifact creature uh, that comes with Unearth. There's a, a two mana soldier that pumps up the team and then you can exile it for five out of the graveyard to put plus one counters on the team. So if you flame blessed bolt a creature like that, or in you know black there's tenacious underdog uh, that still sees a lot of play, then there's no extra graveyard value from those uh, early game creatures and your flame blessed bolt did a better job then play with fire. Um, good against Grixis as well. Uh, Grixis uses um, Blood Tithe Harvester, I think that's his name, the black red uh, vampire. Normally when you uh, kill their Blood Tithe Harvester, then uh, they follow up by exiling it out of the graveyard with their Corpse Appraiser but they can't do that if you exile it. So the fewer creatures there are to eat out of the graveyard, uh, the less there is for a corpse appraiser or for a graveyard trespasser, another very common creature you see running around. So uh, it may look a little bit niche, but um, in a high number of games that you're going to come up against, this card is going to hit, and it's going to hit well. As one mana answers go, this is a good one. All right, Gleeful Demolition. So I wouldn't say this card has quite found a home yet in Standard. I will say that a lot of decks run artifacts. So, you know, first of all, just not even thinking about the goblins. A one mana red sorcery that destroys an artifact may very likely hit a Reckoner Bankbuster. That could be your opponent's turn to play. They could be depending on it to draw themselves a land. You could blow it up. And of course, you can uh, use this for your own deck building synergy. Something I would say if you want this with an aggro deck. Aggro decks, there aren't a lot of good artifact plays, but one that you can do is Rabbit Battery. So you can play Rabbit Battery on turn one, uh, come across for a damage, maybe come across for a damage on turn two, and then you could use Gleeful Demolition to blow it up and turn it into three one ones. So you got two damage out of your Rabbit Battery. Uh, now you've spent those two cards to make three one ones for two mana total over two turns. It's a good. Uh, 
good proposition in terms of damage. Um, stacks up nicely over time. You still have a mana free that second turn to do something like, you know, come on and face his Monastery Swift Spear. So there, uh, there could be some sort of an aggro shell in standard that uses Gleeful Demolition. Another, uh, not terrible at least, two drop you could consider on a budget is Scrapwork Mutt. So this, this lets you do a rummage twice, that's where you discard first and then draw a card. And it has Unearth, so it's got value out of the graveyard, so blowing it up um, doesn't uh, ruin all of the card advantage value uh, and damage you could get out of this. It still, come back, still comes back with haste. Um, mostly this is a card to keep in mind um, as a deck builder. Monoface is Caucasian. So I ended up with four copies of this um, with the jump in and intro decks. You might as well. If you run a, you know, a, a red aggro deck, budget or not, this is uh, one of the best cards for it. Just, uh, you don't have to use every part of the buffalo on this card. Um, it's okay to um, miss the plus one counter on chapter two. It feels bad, obviously. You, uh, you'd like to get the plus one counter off of chapter two. But if it's more important to deal with your uh, opponent's threat, if they're going to, uh, you know, start snowballing away with a lifelink creature, um, make a damage race you can't win, or, uh, you know, there, there are other things that they might get down that you decide it's more important to deal with than to uh, get another threat on the field. It's fine to miss out on chapter two. You'll still get the effects of chapter one and chapter three and the etching and its exile effect um, is extremely relevant to the board state. Like when I was talking about flame blessed bolt, this kind of turns all of your removal spells into flame blessed bolts and your combat damage into flame blessed bolts. That's great. It's, it's just a fantastic card for aggro. Monastery Swift Spear. Uh, this is another one of probably the best red one drops right now. Uh, it's just an uncommon. And if you know you want to make the red aggro deck, uh, Swift Spear is a pretty good option. Uh, th this is sort of Assuming that you generally have a good mix of creatures and spells, and uh, maybe other things like uh, mechanized warfare would trigger the prowess. If you had a really creature heavy deck, um, where everything on the curve is just, you know, a big haste creature, then in that deck I would not run the Swift Spear. If it's only a 1 2 haste prowess, you can do better than that. The Rabbit Battery, for example, is uh, very useful to uh, equip your creatures later. It can give haste, even if the creature doesn't need haste, giving the plus one can let something get through on the board where uh, the Rabbit Battery or the creature you put it on couldn't have on their own. The equipment aspect of Rabbit Battery uh, makes combat math much better for you. And if someone sweeps the board, then it turns back from an equipment into a creature and you've already got, you know, a presence on the battlefield. All of that's to say that uh, the Swift Spear is probably the better card. But there are situations and decks where it might not fit in quite as well if you go really dense on creatures. Play with Fire. This is a uh, shock with added value. Um, but don't fall for the trap. Most of the time, you want this play with fire to burn a blocker out of the way, or kill an aggressive threat that's racing you. Um, if you can deal with the opponent's board and keep letting your creature's damage pile up turn over turn, that's the most efficient way to win the game. Uh, the time where the scry is really nice is if you're very uncertain about hitting a land drop, or if you're flooding out, 
and there are no good targets for the play with fire, you might scry as a kind of a desperation scry, and you know, you don't want to see another land there, you'd rather hit anything else. Um, overall, it's a good card. You can go face. Um, I run it most of the time. Rabbit Battery. So, as I said, this uh, it's not just a 1-1 with haste, it also uh, makes later combat math on further turns more difficult for the opponent and much better for you. And it uh, can sidestep board sweepers by being an equipment at the time. Uh, so let me walk you through a play pattern here I often get into with Rabbit Battery. So Rabbit Battery, you know, comes in, deals a couple points of damage, then uh, the board gets a little bit too clogged up for it to attack. You're playing your, you know, two drop and three drop and trying to be mana efficient. Then the opponent sweeps the board. But maybe you've already equipped the Rabbit Battery to something and now it's the only thing you have left. On your turn, you untap and you play Creepy Puppeteer. Creepy Puppeteer is a red rare, which you may very well have copies of. It's, uh, I think it's the rare you always get in the Double Trouble packet of Jump In. And I don't see a lot of other people run it. Maybe they just don't like having to uh, do a little bit of math to figure out whether it's better to attack with two creatures or five. But very often, I manage to find a way to attack in when I have a creepy puppeteer and another creature. It turns the rapid battery into a 4-3 and come in for 8. It's phenomenal. And uh, heaven help the opponent if you got something with a plus 1 counter from Kimono Face's Kakazan. <laughs> because effects like that um, just boost the creature further once the Creepy Puppeteer gives it a base power and toughness of 4-3. So then you have a 5-3, or it can go even higher up from there. You know, the, the Rabbit Battery itself um, can also boost the creature or the Puppeteer up above a 4-3 to make sure they can get in for an example against Shouldered. So, uh, Rabbit Battery might not be your best one drop, but it's uh, certainly a worthy consideration if you're on a budget and don't have enough cards. Rabbit Battery is very good. Um, will often get you there. Strangle. Uh, this is a powerful card for one mana. Uh, there are a lot of disadvantages to being a sorcery rather than an instant. But dealing a 3 damage for 1 mana is very good at clearing out a blocker that the opponent was probably relying on. I don't know that you want um, a full playset of Strangles. It's, uh, it's a solid option, though. Also puts good pressure on a Planeswalker. Might take a Planeswalker off the board, too. Just... Overall, solid. Um, worthy of consideration. Cannot go face, though. And won't be of much use to you against a control deck. Voldaren Epicure. So, this card is not only good in a mono red burn deck, it's also good in Rakdos Anvil. And uh, could be good in other places. As a one drop, there's a lot of value packed in here. So it enters the battlefield, damages the opponent, and makes an artifact blood token that can help smooth out your draws, or also affects other artifacts' energies. All of that for one mana is a, a solid package. Good card. It's really at its best if you can put the blood token to good use, but it's totally serviceable in a red aggro deck as well. Um, fine consideration, fine card craft. Voltage Surge, this is 
more narrow. This is probably a card you want if you're running Rakdos Anvil, or if you've happened to go with a few more artifacts in your uh, red aggro midrange deck. Like if you have the Epicure, if you have Rabbit Battery, maybe if you chose to go with a copy or two of Scrapwork Mutt, uh, maybe you get the, uh, oh, the new rare uh, Furnace for three mana, builds up oil counters and makes uh, attackers sacrifice at end of turn. If you have a little bit of an artifact slant to an aggro deck, you could run this there as well. That would be fine. Um, I wouldn't run it unless you have artifacts in your deck, for sure. Um, preferably ones you don't mind losing. This is why it's so good in Rakdos Anvil. Um, often you want to lose the artifact in order to trigger the anvil and taking out something for four toughness or less at the same time is great for a one mana card. So if you can get that aspect of Voltage Surge, you need all four of them. If you're not using that aspect of it, then your deck doesn't want it. Scrapwork Mutt. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. So this is kind of a good filler card. Um, if you have a, a good filled out collection, you have better two drops, for sure. But it's not bad. Um, early on, I was using this in uh, my, you know, kind of red mid-range uh, big, big red deck. The rummaging helps get you uh, through to the end game and also helps get rid of uh, all the mountains that you're going to draw, because you will. It's the craziest thing. I made a uh, big red deck, you know, tops out with a six and seven on its mana curve. And I cut it all the way down to 22 mountains because I consistently and continually flooded out. Uh, for that reason, Scrapwork Mutt can do some good work for you. A braid. So I put the four copies here you might have them, like I do. Um, you might want all four copies. There are a lot of artifacts running around in Standard right now. So between being able to deal with, you know, some horrible, enormous artifact like Portal 2 Phyrexia, or uh, an 8-8 that's blowing up your permanents, <laughs> it can also, you know, uh, serviceable uh, removal spell to get a blocker out of the way and keep going forward with your aggro game plan. So the destroy artifact side is, you know, better against control, where you're likely to hit Reckoner, Bank Busters, and other things. And the three damage side is better against opposing aggro decks and mid-range decks. Um, it's one of your better options. Um, Somewhere between one to four copies is probably what you want. Bitter Reunion, so this is a rummage effect. It replaces itself, so you kind of stay neutral on card advantage. You get card selection this way. And a lot of people are using Bitter Reunion um, as a way to fill the graveyard for uh, reanimator decks. It's also just not bad for uh, you know kind of a big red deck where you want to top out into some larger creatures. The ability to give some of those larger creatures haste is very relevant. Uh, just a very solid common all the way around. Plus, leaving a permanent on the battlefield like this is useful for a variety of reasons. Uh, not the least of which is Invoke Despair. This is just a throwaway enchantment um, that just, you know, dinks uh, the opponent's uh, Invoke Despair and makes it... Uh, that much less shiny. So, Kami's Flare. There are a ton of modified creatures in Standard right now. Modified creatures, um, as it says up here, a creature that has counters, or auras, or equipment is considered modified. All the oil counters, all the plus one counters. Equipment like Rabbit Battery, which is very 
easy to put in your deck, very easy to use and equip. Uh, makes a creature modified. Kabano faces Kakazan, which you're probably running already. Makes creatures modified. Uh, there's a very real chance that Kami's Flare might be what you want. You can't blow up artifacts, but in addition to uh, burning out a creature or planeswalker, if you also do two to the face, then this card is pulling double duty and it's great for you. Um, definitely a worthy consideration. Uh, Lightning Strike. The ability to go face as well as to a creature or planeswalker, it'll just win you the game. There will be times where a uh, lightning strike just wins you the game, you know? The opponent gets down to three, they'll have stabilized the board, and they cross their fingers and you top deck a lightning strike and just win. Comes up often enough, you probably want some number of them in your red aggro deck. Uh, I don't think there's quite enough cards to make a red burn deck in standard at the moment, but um, if there ever is, this will be in there. It's good. You know, consider it. Obliterating Bolt. This one's uh feels a little more niche. It's sorcery speed. While it does not deal with Shouldred, it deals with a number of things in the middle. Things that... um. Normally your 1 and 2 mana removal spells don't deal with, like a Planeswalker that's ticked up on loyalty. Or, uh, you know, some, some creature you weren't expecting from the opponent. Like um, uh, the black-white vampire, 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, normally when a dies flips into a coffin and starts making lifelink vampires, you'd be very happy to use Obliterating Bolt on that. There's just a number of examples of things with, you know, three to four toughness that you are very happy to get rid of with Obliterating Bolt and keep gone forever with Exile. Um, it's good, but it's slow. You can't, you know, hold your mana open for it, and it's a little bit niche. And it's also not really what you want against a control deck. Having one or two copies in your deck uh, can be... Uh, very surprising to the opponent when uh, your two mana removal spell unexpectedly does deal with uh, their blocker. Reckless Impulse. If you're not uh, in an artifact synergy deck with the uh, synthesizer and the research desk, then Reckless Impulse is a fantastic way for an aggro deck to just turn up the pressure and keep it on. Uh, this card is especially great if you choose to go with Monastery Swift Spear. It pumps it up and potentially hits more things to also pump up the Swift Spear. It might hit more one-drop hasty threats, more Kimono Faces, Kakazan. Um, you know, keeps your lands rolling in. Edge it all the way around. And because you don't have to play it this turn, it's until the end of your next turn. As long as your curve is low, you're going to be able to make use of the cards you hit off of Reckless Impulse. Um, it won't keep you into a long game, but the idea of having this card in your deck is that you will hit so many threats in rapid succession, it won't be a long game. That's the kind of card advantage that a red aggro deck's looking for. And may very well want all four of them. Alright, Riveteer's Requisitioner. Uh, this little guy's not bad. So if you, uh, if you got the back foot on your start, and you need this as a blocker, the opponent has to get it out of the way, or it'll trade with, you know, pretty much anything on the early turns. And then if they do kill it and don't exile it, you'll get a treasure token, and that accelerates you. If you want to go this route, you know, if you do the playset of the Requisitioners here, that pushes your mana to the point that you might be able to start hitting 4 drops and 5 drops. 
And then you could be thinking about, you know, bigger cards. Um, Creepy Puppeteer. Um, here in the commons, you know, things like Maria's Outrider. Just, uh, when we get into the rares, there's lots of uh, four and five drops that if you uh, want to make a bigger aggro deck or more of a mid-range deck, the Requisitioner could definitely help you to get there. And then blitzing it in for three is also a perfectly reasonable play, replaces itself with a card, leaves a treasure token in its wake. Just, uh, you know, since it can be a hasty threat, like most of the rest of your deck probably, it can come out of nowhere, you know, kill a planeswalker, kill your opponent. It's just, uh, it's a good include, whether you play it for two or blitz it for three. Sardian Cliff Stomper. I'm not sure if you should craft this, but there's uh, the Inklings of a Big Red deck that uses Koth, the new Koth in Phyrexia All Will Be One. And just, you know, kind of go all in on mountains. And then the first time you can trigger this, the first time you, you know, get to uh, four mountains, it'll be a 4 4. That's great. Unfortunately, it uh, dies to a cut down when it's not your turn. It makes a good early game blocker. So if you get into a, you know, kind of a mirror match where your more mid rangey big red deck is going up against aggro, the four toughness is a problem for them. They have to uh, double up on it, either with creature damage and a removal spell or two removal spells. Uh, not a lot of decks run effects like Obliterating Bolt. Or they have to spend three mana and use one of their Shouldra Dancers to kill it. Mirror matches come up a lot uh, with the matchmaker system that they use in MTG Arena, so it's relevant. But yeah, this can be more than four power as well. So the threat keeps growing after you've turned it on. And if you, the opponent doesn't deal with it, then uh, <laughs> unless you're both going big and the opponent goes bigger, you're not likely to, you know, get past six power until before you've won the game, unless you're in a board stall. Um, overall, as a two-drop, it's got lots of mid-late game uh, potential. It seems like a great card. I see why people are uh, brewing around it. So keep it in mind. Sakins and Smelter, I think a one of copy, one, is uh, perfect and the right call in an anvil deck, where you've got those artifact synergies and you want to be sacking artifacts. I think one copy there is good. Uh, because this uh, eats into your other cards that want to sacrifice artifacts, and uh, there can be times where you're struggling to trigger the anvil and you uh, don't want to top deck four of these to where you uh, don't have an artifact for the anvil. I think the one copy, just the one, um, is just perfect in that deck. Um, when you draw it, it'll be great. And the rest of the time, um, the deck will tick off well enough on its own and you won't need it. So having that one copy lurking will be very good for you, if you like the Anvil deck. Voltaic Visionary. I have always liked this card. I used it in budget red builds um, in a much earlier uh, standard, but it's still good. It's three power for two mana. That's uh, a threat the opponent needs to respect. And if you get to activate it, then you get card advantage and you turn it into a 4-3 that can't block. Most of the time you will definitely want to do this as soon as you can. Once in a while, if you're behind on the board, having this as a 3 power blocker is actually better. So 
So if you're in the position where you need this as a blocker and you're, uh, you know, behind losing life, then you don't have to activate it. You can block with it and it does pretty well in that job. But yeah, this can give you uh, an incredibly aggressive start uh, with your red deck. The opponent might mistakenly believe they can race you because you dealt two damage to yourself, um, not accounting for how much damage a 4-3 for two mana is going to end up doing to them. It's a good card. Um, you might not want all four of them. I've got three here that I'm going to craft. But uh, I think you definitely could run all four, and it's, it's just a great card. Yavamaya Steel Crusher, so this card is fair. Um, I don't think you need to go out of your way to craft it. Uh, it's a little bit of a filler card. It can deal with artifacts. That's part of the reason that I've brought it up. Also, the Enlist is not a dead ability. If you're in a board state where you've piled up a couple of attackers, but the opponent has a blocker and you don't have an answer for the blocker, then Yavamaya Steel Crusher could take one of your three power creatures you can't attack with, and list, now it's attacking for five, and it can trade with Shouldred. So, Enlist is not useless. You know, it's not the greatest, but it's not useless. And, uh, since it's got the added modality of dealing with an artifact, I think it's a fine card. I don't think you want, you know, a whole deck full of it, but it's a nice silver bullet and something you, uh, should consider. Daybreak Combatants. So this is another budget deck uh, kind of filler card that you will probably use right at first, early on, when you're making a red deck. And you don't have all of the nice, uh, you know, rares, mythics, and other things to fill it out with. So this can come down as a four power haste. Then it continues to threaten another two damage every turn after that. It can also bolster another one of your creatures. So, uh, you know, if you have a 1-1, like Rabbit Battery, and the opponent has, you know, a 2-2 two -two or something, and you wouldn't want to uh, swing in with a 4-2 Daybreak Combatants, they'll just block it. You put the 2 power on the Rabbit Battery, you swing with both, and you now the opponent kind of has uh, not a great proposition either way they block. It's a fair card. It will win you games. I have used it, and it does, in fact, win games. There are better cards. And when you get those better cards, you can replace this. And until then, this will serve you well. Furnace Punisher. I don't have any of this yet. I've lined up a couple of crafts here. So there will be games where this is, uh, you know, doesn't trigger its damage effect. You'll have games against mono black, you'll have games against mono red, where they've got plenty of basic lands. Maybe uh, mono white, uh, that comes up as well. Or mono blue, uh, mono blue tempo. There are many other decks that use a lot of non-basics, though. Even the soldier's deck uses a lot of non-basics. And then you've got Grixis and Asper and the Legends deck and a lot of things that may not have any basic lands in them at all. So, I don't know that you want four copies of it, but you might. <laughs> in best of three, this seems like a great sideboard card. In best of one, I think you'll punish people often enough when you drop this down where they start taking two damage from it every turn in addition to it being a 3-3 menace. There are enough decks that will probably suffer from this Furnace Punisher that it will do good work for you. I am pretty confident. Uh, people are so greedy with their mana bases right now in Standard. I think um, people could... Uh, do some good work if they adopt um, the lands that uh, blow up non-basics and then fetch out a basic land. 
So the opponent doesn't have any basics, you're just um, stone raiding them. You're just blowing up their lands. This is another way you can punish them. And I think this card is good. Giant Cinder Maw. So this is another uh, silver bullet kind of card. Players can't gain life. If you're red, you're not concerned about gaining life. There might be some uh, multicolor decks with red that would be concerned about gaining life. But um, this is a, a good effect. Good silver bullet card. Helps you uh, absolutely win a damage race with you know, a black deck, the um, Phyrexian Flesh Gorger. It's not as important to kill the Flesh Gorger if it, the opponent's not gaining life. If they're not gaining life, you're in a fair race with them. And you've got a four power three mana card and they have a three power three mana card. Also, Giant Cinder Maw is just uh, fair as far as a uh, on rate for uh, a standard threat. For not having haste, um, it's a 4-3 Trampler. 4 power for 3 mana is a good solid threat. Um, you know, standard has um, become a different place than it was 10-15 uh, years ago. But still, still, a 3 mana 4-3 Trampler is a threat that the opponent must respect and must deal with. Left unanswered, it will win you the game. Um, you know, like this uh, pairs up favorably in trades against, um, like the new, um, what is it, a Blight Belly something? There's uh, that green proliferate creature for three minutes, a 4 4. This will trade with it, take it off the board. So, uh, you know, pairs up pretty well against other things at its mana cost, and has a nice effect tacked onto it. I'll help you win the game. Definitely consider it. Pentagon Strongbull. I'm just going to put this here as an idea, as a one of in a Rakdos Anvil deck. That's all I really wanted to say about Pentagon Strongbull. So, moving on. Rebel Salvo. So, this card is kind of the new replacement for Rending Flame for dealing with Shouldred and other 5 mana, I mean, 5 toughness. Five toughness threats. Um, they also both hit planeswalkers for five. That's worth noting. So this is kind of a shouldered planeswalker answer. The Rebel Salvo, um, if you happen to have equipment, can be cheaper than three mana, in which case it's amazing. <laughs> amazing at that mana value. Um, and there are equipment that, uh, come in and make a creature and uh, attach to the creature. All the new four Mirrodin cards, or um, Citizen's Crowbar. This also makes the permanent lose indestructible, and that added text on the card. Uh, especially with the new um, oh, Mythic Legends uh, that can gain indestructible. In Phyrexia all will be one. This card is much better, much better, than Rending Flame. Um, there are a handful of spirits running around in Standard that you can hit, like in the uh, Green-White Enchantment deck. Um, you can often burn out a spirit there and deal two to the opponent, but... Rebel Salvo is just so much better <laughs> in so many other situations. It's by far the superior card, and you should take your Rending Flames out of your decks and replace them with Rebel Salvos. Big score. So, uh, I could see a big red deck going in for a big score to ramp up their mana to get to those late game cards. Also goes well into Reanimator to discard something to the graveyard and have the mana you need to uh, pull it back the next turn. Even with uh, Invoke Justice, which costs four white mana. Those treasure tokens will help you cast Invoke Justice. Or, it goes well into control decks, right, to draw cards at the end of the opponent's turn, give you a mana advantage, or it goes well into uh, 
potentially combo decks. I saw Covert Go Blue, um, YouTuber, streamer, doing stuff with this card, and um, Mind Splice Apparatus. Where, uh, if you get it down to one red mana, this goes mana positive. It starts, uh, you know, making more mana than it costs. That's an awful lot of archetypes that this can fit into. So for that reason, I think it's well worthy of crafting if you don't already have four like I do. And you might, because if you've uh, got the new player decks and jump in, maybe you've already got this. But I just want to highlight how many different decks it can go into. Pyrrhic Blast, the only reason I'm mentioning this card, this isn't a good card. Unless there ends up being some kind of a weird, janky combo where you can get a creature with 20 or more power. Um, this did exist uh, recently in Standard. There was uh, a, a funky deck that uh, could make a creature token that had uh, power and toughness equal the number of cards in your library, and then uh, they could sacrifice it to deal that damage straight to the opponent's face. If something like that happens to come up in Standard, and this card will be in Standard for a long time, just, just remember that there is a way to deal damage to the opponent's face um, with a creature. The, uh, the card that most people remember like this is Fling, but Pyrrhic Blast. If a janky uh, combo deck like that comes up in standard, this card exists. Mary is Outrider. So, probably more of a multicolor card, but you can uh, get the Streets of Nuka Penalands into a mono red deck, and this could come down and burn the opponent for five. And if you can do that, if you can reliably uh, burn the opponent for 3, 4, or 5 when this comes down, it has a 4-4 four, four reach. 4-4 four, four reach is a good body on the battlefield, and uh, just ETB damage to the opponent's face is good. But it's uh, a little hard to build the deck around. Just something to remember that it's here. The Fall of Krug, the only re reason I'm mentioning this card is it destroys a land. That's it. It's the only reason I'm mentioning it. The uh, the uncommon colorless lands that uh, blow up a non-basic and then uh, both players fetch a basic, those lands are better than this spell. And this does deal damage to the opponent's face and one damage to each creature they control. That could kill some mites or something. Um, at six mana this is terrible, basically. I think it's uh, the only spell in standard right now that says destroy a land. So that's why I'm mentioning it. If you really must destroy a land, then you've already got the uh, copies of the uh, uncommon lands maxed out. Here's another one. Blitz Automaton. This is a great card. Great card. I. Uh, I use this even now in my budget, um, you know, kind of mid-range, go big uh, red deck. So it can, it, you can play it in aggro. A three mana, three two with haste. It's an aggro card. You can play it. You can use it. It's serviceable. Being an artifact, it actually dodges uh, go for the throat. It's not the worst. And if you uh, played Kimono Faces Kakazan on turn two, and you play this on turn three, yeah, it's a heck of a threat. Heck of a threat at that point. You also can cast it for seven. It doesn't come up that much in an aggro deck. It's still fine, though. But in a, uh, a big red deck, where maybe you can uh, power out the opponent with an aggro start, but maybe you also have lasting power into the end game, with some cards we'll look at in the rares and mythics. 
then the Blitz Automaton can come down for seven, swing in for six, win you the game. It has happened for me. It has happened. Does happen. <laughs> I'll vouch for it. And finally, I want to mention that if equipment becomes a deck in standard, or if you want to brew around this deck, be the one who makes it a thing in standard. All of your four Mirrodin cards, your uh, citizens crowbars and such. Um, if you have two equipment, this is a five mana, seven five trampler. Well, you know, it's just kind of a big dumb creature, but seven power trampling is very relevant. <laughs> Three attacks with this will just kill the opponent. And presumably, you could put equipment on this. <laughs> just to point that out, just, you know, I'm just saying, if it's uh, an equipment deck, then this already very significant creature with Trample uh, can pick up yet more equipment. And if you've had a curve, you know, like, two, three, four, Citizen's Crowbar, or uh, the new Formiridon one, and then uh, three mana four mirrored and four mana four mirrored and then uh, you know you've curved out with creatures effectively, and then with uh, three equipment on the board, this would cost four mana. So if you do that with a two three four, you can play this the next turn. And if you uh, actually lead in with a one mana equipment. In the Colorless Crafting Guide, he gave an honorable mention to uh, Eater of Virtue, which you probably have in your collection, uh, which is, it's legendary, but as a one-of copy, it's a very serviceable piece of equipment. If you go one drop equipment, two drop, three drop, you curve right into this at four mana. And at four mana, I think this card's starting to be unfair. It's starting to reach the point where um, you untap with it and win the game. Especially if you slap an Eater of Virtue on it and you have 9 trample damage. The opponent must interact with you, really, at that point. Anyway, uh, big dumb creatures often don't make it in Constructed, but if you lower the mana cost on this by enough, it doesn't even take that much. It could have a deck. It could. It really could. I just want to point that out. Whether it's good and limited or not, we're talking about synergies and constructed. All right. On to the rares and mythics. Before the uh, rares and mythics, let me go ahead and craft these. All right. There. We go. Bloodthirsty adversary. This sees a lot of play in red decks, for good reason. 2-2 uh, two, two with haste for 2. Uh, very much is a thing that the decks want right now, especially because Kimono faces Kakazan is a thing. You'd like to get your um, enchantment cooking as soon as you can, your saga. So if you play that on turn 1, turn 2 you'd like a creature, preferably with haste. This fits that bill. Later in the game, you can do its enters the battlefield sort of kicker cost and get back a burn or removal spell, or even card advantage, um, like Reckless Impulse. And the card is just great at different stages of the game for that reason. It's just a great card for most uh, red aggro players. And I think this card has chops for other decks. Any deck where you want to uh, copy instants and sorceries out of your graveyard, for example. I know most uh, decks like that are not thinking about this card because, it, you know, they think it's an aggro card. But you could use this to, you know, copy card draw spells, uh, bounce spells, 
board sweepers, little ones like Brotherhood's End. Um, and if you uh, paint the mana on this twice, it would actually survive the Brotherhood's End. Or you could blow up all artifacts with it. Um, there are a lot of potential deck building uh, ideas that Bloodthirsty Adversary could go into. It's, it has more depth than just being an aggro drop but it serves amazingly as an aggro drop. Great card, you won't be sorry if you craft it. Felden Ronim Excavator. So, had uh, two mana, two mana haste creatures. These are pretty much your two go-to options here. Felden's Legendary. So whether you want to craft multiples is up to you. I think the one copy is just amazing. You can attack it into uh, an unfavorable board state just to kill him and find another card. You know, the opponent blocks with a 4-4. Four, four. You just let him die and choose your uh, best card from the top four. You can cast it until the end of your next turn. Uh, Felden can't block. Um, it's another way he's maybe a little worse than the adversary. Overall, though, it's a great card in aggro. Most of the time you'll probably end up trading him with something, and then he replaces himself with another card, and that's that's just good. Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Uh, what can I say? It's um, Some people say it's the best card in Standard. Uh, if you're new and you'd like me to explain... <laughs> So it makes a 2-2 a immediately, and that 2-2, if it goes unanswered, or even if it doesn't have a good attack it can make, every time it attacks it makes a treasure token, and a lot of decks that run this card really just want the treasure token, and they will let their goblin shaman die, uh, because they want to ramp mana that badly. So sometimes it's correct to kill that 2-2 as soon as you see it, but unfortunately the card has uh, a lot of value packed into it. On chapter 2, you can uh, do a double rummage, discard up to two cards, and then if you do, draw that many. Um, it just feels terrible when you see the opponent discard two lands and then pick up two more cards with this. Uh, sometimes your choices are much harder than that. Sometimes uh, you have to decide if maybe the right call is not discarding anything at all. But the number of times this can uh, turn your lands into spells, or, t or turn your lands into more lands, and just get you deeper in the deck. <sighs> it's so good. And it fills up your graveyard for reanimator strategies, so it's excellent there as well. And you need the mana ramp to cast your reanimator spell to pull the thing back from the graveyard. <sighs> but the value doesn't stop there. On chapter 3, it flips into Reflection of Kiki Jiki. And that, once it doesn't have summoning sickness, can make uh, token copies of creatures that gain haste and sacrifice at the beginning of the next instep. And that effect is so powerful. It can be activated at instant speed, can create blockers, and can, you know, create a creature with an enters the battlefield effect, or, you know, like a sacrifice trigger, like the death, Blood Tithe Harvester. Enters the battlefield, makes a blood token, then you can sacrifice the token copy to kill a creature, now a bigger creature, because you have more blood tokens. At the end of the day, um, just even, you know, looking at the card from a, a fair perspective, if all this card did was uh, made a pair of two twos and let you rummage two cards, it still might be worth it. And it does do that, even without the added text on those two twos. It's, um, it's depressingly good, because it generally just takes multiple cards to deal with it. Or cards that cost more mana than this card cost. One of the rare exceptions is the uh, white creature Lauren of the Third Path. She lines up very well against Fable of the Mirror Breaker.
Um, and Invoke Despair. Invoke Despair does a pretty good job of dealing with, uh, you know, the front side of the card and the back side of the card. But that costs five and this costs three. Fable of the Mirror Breaker. It's depressingly good. It's uh, disgustingly everywhere. You should probably craft it. Mm, you know. Geist Flame Reservoir. This is an interesting card. Even if you uh, don't have a lot of instants and sorceries in your deck, it can pay to exile the top card. You can play it this turn, so it's an endless source of card advantage that costs mana. That means you really don't want two, because the second one you might not be able to activate at all, while the first one you're using putting mana into the first one. One copy is not bad, though. And it gets much better in a deck that has a lot of instants and sorceries, because then this is an extra burn spell. And you can tailor it down to as small as you need. You can pull one charge counter off, deal one damage to Thalia, um, you know, kill a small creature with it. Use the counters as you need them. And finally, you know, it could help to finish off the opponent with a burn to the face. Overall, one copy, it's not bad. You can probably do better, but it's not bad. Reckless Stormseeker, this is a great three drop. Just fantastic for red aggro. Also for a red mid-range, like kind of beat down, uh, you know, bigger strategy. So it's good at the small end, it's good at the top end. Um, you, you will be happy enough with this card if you craft it. It's really good. Can continue to give your other creatures boosts. So it can give itself haste the turn it comes down, then it can just keep boosting other creatures. If, if it flips tonight, it becomes just lethal. Just incredibly deadly. You know, it could be a 5-4 trample haste, or it can make one of your other little things into something that trades with Shouldred. It's a great card. Uh, at the 3 mana mark, it's um, kind of, you know, elbowing for room with Squee, Dubious Monarch. Squee is legendary. Uh, he's not the worst in multiples, though. Uh, really, though, the one copy of Squee is a great include in the deck. So, if you have a, a good attack with him, he just comes in, makes a goblin token, and now the opponent must stop him, must deal with him. Because if you just keep making these goblin tokens, you're going to run away with the game. And Squee can come back from the graveyard. You know, pay four, exile four other cards from the graveyard, and you can cast him again. So he is a recursive threat for a red aggro burn deck. Um, if you're running Bloodthirsty Adversary, and you have a choice of uh, being able to leave something in your graveyard, leave a spell down there for the adversary, and eat up all the creatures so your opponent's graveyard trespasser doesn't get to eat them, <laughs> or their uh, corpse appraiser. This exile those creatures. Squeeze a good card. I think one copy is uh, just good. Just a good include for an aggressive deck. Urabrask's Forge. This card is a little bit slower than the two we just looked at. Squee and Reckless Stormseeker. And I think Urabrask's Forge is maybe for a bigger red deck. Maybe not for aggro. It's not the worst in aggro. It makes a creature the turn you uh, cast it, and it keeps getting better over time. But in a deck that goes a little later, or especially in a deck that has some, uh, you know, proliferate or oil counter synergies, this could become scary quickly. And it has this inevitability where if the opponent doesn't deal with it sooner or later, it'll win you the game. Overall, it's a neat card. Maybe not an aggro card, but uh, could be a potential include in a variety of other decks, including some, you know, aristocrat sacrifice type of decks. 
It's interesting. Brotherhood's End. It's a great craft. There are artifacts to deal with in Standard, like Reckoner Bank Buster, or little Power Stone tokens that ramp the opponent, or Blood tokens. There are definitely artifacts to blow up, and uh, if you come up against an Anvil deck, if you're running this card in your main deck, especially more than one copy, they might as well just um, scoop it up and start another game. And the three damage to each creature in each Planeswalker is also very relevant. These modes can even be relevant against control. Three to each Planeswalker and each creature can sweep up the tokens made by Planeswalkers and then shrink their Planeswalkers, potentially kill them. Um, they might have a bunch of little artifacts, Reckoner Bank Busters running around. This isn't just good against aggro, it's, um, it's good in a variety of situations. It's a pretty good sweeper. Well worth craft. Chandra Dressed to Kill. Uh, you pretty much need a mono red deck to make any real use of this Chandra. That being said, she's really good. <laughs> she's really good. She ramps your mana, you know, helps you hit your uh, four, five, even six drops. So Chandra can go quite well into a big red deck. She also goes quite well into aggro. You know, drop down on three plus one, make another one drop. Then as you're running out of gas, just start exiling cards as you plus. Get lands out of the way, hit more spells. Uh, she doesn't often get to her ultimate. Um, par partly that's because she doesn't protect herself very well. Usually she's in an aggressive deck that's not trying to protect her. So often Chandra will get hit with uh, other creatures and other spells, but if she survives for any length of time, she's uh, distracting the opponent, helping you win the damage race, you know, directing things away from your face as you're powering them down. She's a great card. Mechanized Warfare. People are using this. Um, bolsters the damage of your red and artifact sources by one point. Has some neat tricks, like um, the one mana spell we looked at. It deals one damage to your opponent's creatures and to your opponent. So uh, there are ways to uh, maximize the synergy of mechanized warfare. I'm not completely sold that you need to craft it. And there's another card we're going to look at. That's a new card from Phyrexia All Will Be One has some similarities to Mechanized Warfare. I think maybe that card's better. People do use this though, and you should at least think about it. Creepy Puppeteer. This card's great. Um, I don't see it used very often. I don't see people use it against me very often. It doesn't seem to be highly adopted by the other red mages of the world. It's fabulous. It's great. It is definitely one of the cards that uh, wins me the game a lot in red. I was talking about the play patterns earlier with uh, Rabbit Battery, where it can you know, drop back as a creature after a sweeper, and you come in with a Puppeteer and just swing in for eight. There are so many situations where you have you know, a modified creature, something that's got a plus one counter on it, something that's equipped up with your Rabbit Battery, there are tons of situations where the Creepy Puppeteer attacks in with something and it becomes more than a 4-3. You know, <laughs> you, let's say you've got a 1-1, one, one, Reckless Stormseeker, Creepy Puppeteer, and the opponent has Shouldred. If the 1-1 one, one has a, got a plus 1 counter on it, makes a 2-2, two, two, and Creepy Puppeteer would make it 5 power and it could get through. The Reckless Stormseeker can give the Creepy Puppeteer plus 1 power, and now it can get through. Or the Rabbit Battery could be equipped on Tier 1-1. One, one. It's a 5 power now. There's a, there's a lot of ways you can tinker with the combat math with Creepy Puppeteer. Find a way to get a profitable attack, where if your opponent blocks, there's a trade. 
Um, it's such a dangerous card. It creates so much power on the battlefield. It is, as I said, it's definitely one of the ways I often win the game. Um, I couldn't count the number of games where I see my opponent go from 17 to 9. Because of Creepy Puppeteer. Atsushi, the Blazing Sky. So if you want a kind of a big red deck, um, Atsushi is a great card. There's uh, not as much exile removal in Standard at the moment. Uh, that could start to change a little bit with the new set, but most of the time people are still uh, killing things or sacrifice, and that means that Sushi will do the trigger. If you're in a big red deck, very often the right choice is to make three treasure tokens. Now you can cast, you know, burn down the house or some other devastating five mana play, such as, uh, you know, you could go for Chaotic Transformation, for example, or Capricious Hellraiser. Or uh, there's a dragon that's a 4 or 5, enters the battlefield and deals 4 damage to something that has fire breathing. Anyway, if you have a big red deck, Atsushi the Blazing Sky is a great choice. It, it blocks so well. Uh, it does very good work for you. Jaya, Fiery Negotiator. Who doesn't love Jaya Ballard, Task Mage? They used to call her Jaya. Um, but I, I think maybe it's Jaya. Some of my favorite uh, flavor text of all time comes from uh, cards that have a quote from Jaya on them. And she says some of those lines now when you play her. Um, unfortunately, in the storyline, she's dead. But um, I still love her. She is uh, one of my favorite magic characters of all time. And this Planeswalker, this card, is good. So creating a monk with prowess, it doesn't have haste, and it's only got one toughness, so it's not quite as good as Monastery Swift Spear. But, um, you know, she protects herself by plussing. Putting creatures onto the battlefield by plussing is nice. And they have prowess, so they are more threatening than they appear. Minus one uh, digs you to your next card. Since you exile two and you choose one, um, just be careful that if you, you know, you, you don't get to choose both of them. If you play a land, you won't get to uh, do the other one if it's a spell. Just pay attention. <laughs> For minus two, this requires a little bit of thought. Um, but you can uh, definitely change the, uh, the combat math with the minus two. Suddenly, maybe Shouldred's going to die if she blocks. Or maybe Shouldred's going to die because you went wide. And clearly, the minus eight would be amazing. She doesn't usually get there. But the uh, those first three abilities are all serviceable and all good. And one copy of this in your, um, you know, kind of mid-range or big red deck. She'll do good work for you. I've seen it happen. Koth, Fire of Resistance. I like Koth. I think he's good. So you can minus three to kill just about anything. The turn he comes down. Uh, if it's Shouldred, then uh, might need to be one more turn to get uh, five mountains. Still, he, you know, kills most things. His plus is good. If you're in a big red deck and, uh, you know, you're thinking about a bunch of six mana cards or even um, the prototype creature we looked at, where it can be, uh, you know, a six, four haste for seven, in at three mana, it's a respectable creature to pressure the opponent with, but it can also go big in a deck with Koth, where he fetches up mountains and it turns into its full potential. And uh, you only have to plus Koth twice before you can get the emblem 
if you get the emblem, which is not unreasonable, you're probably just winning the game. Every mountain you play dealing four damage to any target, mm, that's hard to come back from. I think Koth is good. I think crafting a copy of him is definitely good. Solfim, Mayhem Dominus. I can never remember this card's name, but uh, Solfim, Mayhem Dominus, <laughs> is a threat unto himself. 5 4 for 4. That's respectable. Nothing wrong with it. He says if a source you control would deal non combat damage to an opponent or a permanent opponent controls, it deals double. So he does some of the same tricks that Mechanized Warfare does, not with your creatures, and not with your artifacts, but with um, the spell we were looking at. You know, one mana deals one damage to your opponent and their creatures. Sulfim does the same trick with that spell that Mechanized Warfare does. Unlike Mechanized Warfare, Sulfim is a 5-4 threat. I have, uh, I have often seen mono-red decks across the table from me lose while they have a Mechanized Warfare on the table. Or two Mechanized Warfares on the table. Uh, sometimes they draw that Mechanized Warfare at the wrong moment. It doesn't uh, give them the punch that they need. They needed a spell or a creature. And uh, they can lose because the Warfare is a helper piece that needs other cards. Solfim does not. Right, just at a base rate, it's a 5-4 four for 4. It can attack and win. It can also uh, attack into a Shouldered, no more notably. <laughs> and that's not all. You can uh, a 1 and 2 Phyrexian red so you can either pay uh, four life and a colorless, or two red and a colorless, or some combination thereof. And discard two cards, which is a heck of a cost, and put an indestructible counter on this. That's not the ability on this card I'm most excited about. The indestructible counter, I don't think that's really what you're gunning for with this card. I don't think it's the important part of it. Now, if you're in a mirror match with another red deck, then it might possibly be worth two cards to have an indestructible 5-4 where they just cannot, cannot profitably get through on the ground. Um, it's just an added benefit, let's say. Mostly playing it as a, a big creature that doubles your uh, non-combat damage. Oh yeah, so it would work with your artifacts. not. Not artifact uh, creatures. Oh, and it does, it'll work with creatures if it's not combat damage. I've kind of been thinking about Sulfim the wrong way. He, uh, he doubles a lot more damage than you would think. Okay, so it's just combat damage he doesn't affect. Everything else. Okay. Oh, there's some, okay. There's a couple of cards they didn't mention in common, like Thermo Alchemist and stuff, but he does bolster those cards. It might be something to watch out for. Overall, I think um, Sulfim is good, and possibly better than Mechanized Warfare for your deck, because he is a big threat. Aside from, you know, it's not just an enchantment. He can get in there. I like him for that reason. All right, the Elder Dragon War. You get a, a little sweeper effect. You get a, a potentially a complete replacement of your hand. Um, any number of cards you can discard and draw that many. Most of the time, the two cards on Fable of the Mirror Breaker is as much as you need. Once in a while, you would like to discard more than that, and the Elder Dragon War can do that. Final chapter can make a 4-4 red dragon with flying. And you can read ahead. 
so uh, you don't have to sit through all the chapters. This is a good card. Um, four mana for a two damage sweeper is a, a little later than you'd like. But it's still a good card. It'll probably do good work for you if you use it, if you craft it. Most sagas have enough decent value proposition that uh, you can make them work. This, is, this one is no different. It's a good card. Thundering Raiju. This is still uh, one of the best aggro deck cards you can craft. There are so many um, modified creatures that uh, when this comes in and attacks, it's not attacking modified creatures that Thundering Raiju cares about. It's if you control any at all, it counts the number of them. And it deals damage. Or, uh, other than the Raiju. It, this card is so amazingly powerful. I, I'd probably give it the nod slightly above Creepy Puppeteer, but let me just say that uh, Creepy Puppeteer and Thundering Raiju play very well together. The plus one counters that the Raiju hands out are incredibly valuable to the Puppeteer, because even one counter pumps that other creature up to a 5 power. Putting that counter on the Puppeteer is fabulous, too. Anyway, Thundering Raiju. Well worth considering. Visions of Phyrexia. Uh, this is a good card. Oddly enough. Uh, probably better most of the time than the Geist Flame Reservoir. If you have specifically an instant sorcery deck, the Geist Flame Reservoir might be better. Visions of Phyrexia uh, doesn't cost you mana to exile a card and then you can play it this turn. Uh, the first turn you play it, all you get is the tapped power stone. Hopefully you can find a way to use it. Uh, in a Rakdos Anvil deck, I've used this in an Anvil deck before. You just uh, you know you set a stop on the end step. You let the visions of Phyrexia make the Power Stone token, and then you sacrifice the Power Stone token while it's still your turn, and you get the one one from the Anvil. Anyway, uh, this is this is a good card. You don't want four copies of it. It's too slow. You don't want you don't want all four. Uh, one copy, though, has been great for my big red deck. Um, just punches me through, you know, six mountains in a row in my deck that has 22 lands in it. <laughs> Shuffler is fine. And um, it's great. Gets me back in the game. So, overall, fabulous card. As a one-of. Maybe a two of. Burn down the house. This is a good enough card. You might want all four of them. Uh, it's one of the best red sweepers. Part of the reason that it's one of the best red sweepers um, hits creatures and planeswalkers. Uh, it's not the only card that does something like this, but it has the other mode of making the three devils. And that means it's not a dead draw against a creatureless, even planeswalkerless uh, control deck. In that case, it can make the three red devils, and when each of those devils die, it also deals a damage to their face or any other target. And they have haste. So this card is decent enough pressure as a threat, and a good enough board sweeper as its, you know, kind of main use, that I think, you know, crafting at least one copy is great, and, you know, you, you can, like, cram a copy of this into your red aggro deck, and you won't get to five mana all the time, but, uh, surprise! <laughs> the opponent will not be expecting you to have this. Can finish them off with the devils, can, uh, you know, turn around a mid-range board state where they were just, you know, piling out planeswalkers and thought they'd run away with the game, and you just 180 them back to parity. 
can also be good as four copies in a big red deck. Volatile Arsonist. This card is amazing. It's so good. It, it requires a little bit of math. That's probably why most people don't like it. But Volatile Arsonist, um, in a similar way to the Creepy Puppeteer, can make it to where it can attack through things, and your other creatures can attack through things that they couldn't otherwise. So one damage to a creature, one damage to a player, one damage to a Planeswalker. That's nice. If they have a Planeswalker, it's very relevant to deal any amount of damage to it. One damage to the player, that's nice. <laughs> it's like it has an extra point of power that uh, didn't require combat. Or at least, you know, combat damage to go through. One damage to a creature, that's the most important part. You know, so the easy, the easy mode is if they have one toughness creature and you just kill it. But um, the more difficult mode is when you realize you can attack with this into Shouldred. Uh, for one thing, if they're only blockers, Shouldred has menace. But uh, if you deal a damage to Shouldred, then even if they have two blockers, uh, it has menace. And if Shouldred blocks it, in that case, it trades. It's probably not what the opponent wanted, but this card puts so much pressure on the opponent, deals so much damage, they very well might take the trade. I often see it happen. The backside of this card is just bonkers. If it flips into night, might be a good reason to run uh, the Stormseeker in your deck to have the day-night cycle already uh, ticking. The night side of this card, whew, going up to five power and going up to two damage on that attack trigger, it's unreal. It, mm. If you haven't used it, you don't know. But yeah, there are just so many board states where um, the attack trigger on the arsonist, front or the back, can help it and your other creatures uh, to get through where uh, the opponent will be forced to trade if they get into combat. It is such a great top end on an aggressive deck. You won't be sad. It'll kill people. Just requires a little bit of math. All right, Chaotic Transformation. Um, you've probably seen this card at work. Um, if you haven't, this is a neat uh, kind of build around card where the idea is to get some uh, tokens into play, like token creatures, treasure tokens, blood tokens, um, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe a little cheap uh, enchantment you don't care as much about, like Bitter Reunion. And you go turn all of them into uh, something else. You can take the opponent on a wild ride as well. Um, that can backfire spectacularly, but it's fun. <laughs> you know, maybe the opponent's uh, got their um, cruelty of gicks ticking towards its chapter 3, you don't want them to reanimate a creature, and you take a chance that maybe they've got a different enchantment somewhere in their deck. So you target it, exile it, see what you hit. Maybe it's another Cruelty of Gix. Um, that got you kind of a micro card advantage in that case, where you didn't stop the effect from happening, but you've uh, thinned a powerful spell out of their deck. Um, unfortunately, it could backfire by them uh, taking the chapter two on the next Cruelty of Gix, and then they uh, get to tutor up another card. Anyway. Chaotic Transformation is a lot of fun. Usually you just want to use it on your own permanents. Um, safe enough to use it on an opponent's land. If they've got some annoying land like a Murex, just hit that sucker, turn it into something else. Uh, overall, if you've built around this card, it can be good. Um, I don't recommend especially to uh, craft it unless you love the idea of brewing with it. 
arcane bombardment. This one's another brew around, but um, you can make a budget arcane bombardment deck because if this is, you know, your one big craft you make for the deck is two copies of this mythic, maybe three, probably not all four. The rest of your deck can be full of, uh, you know, just a bunch of decent card draw interactive spells, uh, this and that, maybe some uh, spells that make creatures and other things. Then you can make a budget arcane bombardment deck, and that might be fun. I'm not going to totally craft it though. Uh, Capricious Hellraiser, it remains to be seen whether uh, this card is completely bonkers or whether it's just kind of fair and doesn't see much standard play. So, it only costs three if you have nine or more cards in the graveyard, but you have more control over what this will hit if you have fewer cards in the graveyard. If you only have three cards in the graveyard when you uh, have this enter the battlefield, then you know what uh, you're going to hit. If you only have three cards, then they're not random anymore. You can cast a non-creature, non-land card without paying its mana cost. So it can't just be an all-creature stack. You can't get another copy of the uh, Hellraiser, for example. That uh, requires a little bit of deck building consideration. But this can do silly things like reanimate a portal to Phyrexia. So, it's an interesting option. Keep it in mind. All right. Talked about all the red rares and mythics. Now I need to choose one rare and one mythic here. I still... Uh, Felden's good doesn't go in a wide variety of decks, though. Fable, oof, it's so multi-purpose. Um, yeah, everyone's sick of it. It's really good, though. Um, Stormseeker goes well either um, in you know aggro or mid-range bigger decks. Don't think I need to get too many more copies of Squee. I like Urbrask's Forge. That's interesting. Brotherhood's End. This unlocks more control deck archetypes for red, and that's rare. Um, it's hard to find good control deck cards for red. So Brotherhood's End is definitely a big consideration. Mechanized Warfare, I don't think I'm going to craft this one. Creepy Puppeteer, already uh, happy to have one or two. It would, would be good to have more, but it doesn't go in a wide variety of decks. Yeah. Uh, get past some mythics here. Koth! Koth is rare. Alright, definitely in contention, Koth. Elder Dragon War um, is applicable in a you know kind of wider variety of decks. Don't think um, I don't think it's going to be my choice here. Raiju is great, like the Puppeteer, um, not great in a wide variety of decks. Visions don't need too many of them. Burn down the house would definitely be happy to go up to uh, four copies, but. I also like variety. Transformation is very much a build around. I'm not confident that I have enough uh, cards in the collection yet, and I'd rather have more copies of the transformation if I'm going to craft around it. I think my choice of rare here is between Brotherhood's End and Koth, Fire of Resistance. It is a hard choice. Um, I don't think Koth goes in as wide a variety of decks as Brotherhood's End does. Brotherhood's End, you are my choice of rare. Alright, for the Mythic. Um, Adversary's great. I've got her on my other account. Um, rather, uh, try to see some other cards here. Chandra Dress to Kill, great option. At Sushi, uh, love them, already got some of them though. Jaya, very powerful. 
Koth of uh, oh, Solfim. Very cool. The Arsonist. Mm. Doesn't go in that big of a variety of decks, but oof. Uh, bombardment. I think I'd like to have more than one copy if I'm going to build around it. And the Hellraiser. Hellraiser is very interesting. Okay. I think I am between Capricious Hellraiser and Jaya Fiery Negotiator for my Mythic Craft. Oh, and Soul Film. Okay, those three. I think... Jaya probably goes in the most decks. Hellraiser um, hasn't necessarily proven its metal yet, and neither has Soul Film. I feel like one copy of Solfim is going to be really good for some of the red decks that I want to build. I really like having one copy of a legend. Yeah, normally I like cards that wear a lot of uh, different hats, have a lot of wide application. Normally I would probably craft uh, Jaya here. But Solfim is very interesting to me. I think he's very good. I think I'm going to craft Solfim. Solfim, Mayhem Dominus. I choose you as my mythic rare. Alright, that brings us to the end of Red. So, if I have brought you some value or enjoyment today, like and subscribe to this channel helps me out. And next time we're going to look at green. Until then, Stay cool.